Hello friends. As you've probably seen, this is another video responding to consistently wrong person on the internet and terrible moustache haver 42, who I wasn't intending on responding to again for quite a while, but I was encouraged to do so when I discovered that not only has the toxic masculinity thing made a weird resurgence in recent discourse, but also after I made my most recent video on the subject I was sent this image and it just made me want to discuss it again. Before we move on to the video, let's discuss the truths that memes like this pretend to impart. So first off the bat, that that's not what toxic masculinity is. I'm not going to go into it too much here because I did that in my last video and I'll probably end up doing so again throughout this video, but just for reference, when many people hear the phrase toxic masculinity, they make the mistake of assuming that someone is declaring that being a man is inherently bad. The knee-jerk assumption that masculinity is under attack, however, misses the actual point. Toxic masculinity is a term from social sciences that describes norms of accepted behaviours among men that are portrayed as good and natural but are, in reality, physically, socially and psychologically damaging. Toxicity doesn't come from being male or masculine, it doesn't describe all or even most masculine coded behaviours or ideals. Excelling at sports, for example, isn't considered to be part of toxic masculinity, neither is being ambitious or having the drive to succeed. The desire to improve yourself and achieve more is, rightfully, lauded as a good thing. Masculinity becomes toxic when specific standards of behaviour are encouraged and enforced despite being damaging. Dominance, violence, unchecked sexual aggression, self-reliance to the point of absurdity, and the devaluation of anything seen as being feminine are all points where masculinity goes from being positive to toxic. It's the mandating of the limited scope of what men are allowed to be if they're to be considered real men. Manhood in this ideal isn't inherent but performative. Identifying as male isn't enough to be a man. If you don't perform these specific actions or model these behaviours, you are not a real man. Okay, maybe that wasn't as brief as I originally thought, but ultimately this is irrelevant because because even if it was and toxic masculinity just meant masculinity is inherently toxic, we could still attribute a number of these actions to an insecurity stemming from certain men's inability to reach the imagined ideal of exaggerated masculinity. Men are repeatedly told throughout their lives that they should be dominant and powerful which leads to a lot of insecure men becoming angry or frustrated and potentially violent if they see a woman being more dominant and powerful than them. Not to mention the fact that as men are dissuaded from expressing their emotions in a healthy way, often this can lead to of reliance on anger and violence as the only socially acceptable emotional outlets. This is where a lot of misogynistic violence comes from. Likewise, with the using part, men are often told that sexual prowess is an indicator of masculinity, which can often cause men who are unable to manipulate women into bed to do so, and those who aren't to become incels. Our society too treats women less like people and more like objects, which coupled with rewarding men for promiscuity while simultaneously shaming women for it, can lead to a culture in which men don't respect women at all and are more likely to use them for sex. Although of course many women do actually enjoy casual sex but this is all by the by. Also why do women need protecting? Protection from who? Ask yourself that. We need more masculinity is the sort of sentiment that causes toxic masculinity in the first place. Also this image appears to be confusing masculinity with compassion which is a trait more commonly associated with femininity but let's just leave that for now. It will come up again later on and we do in fact have a video to fact check today. What makes a man is it the power in his hands is it his quest for glory give it all you got to to fight to the top so we can know your story It turns out, 42 is not only wrong about music, but also general concepts like offence and masculinity. So let's see what this guy here, the epitome of manhood, the ultimate alpha male, has to say about what it means to be a real man, if you can find time between lifting and pounding your mum behind the bins at his local Tesco like an absolute chad. This video, incidentally, is responding to the infamous Gillette commercial from a few months back, which basically asserted that, hey, maybe letting kids beat the shit out of one another and hitting on random women on the street minding their own business 
Us is, well, not cool. I'd recommend watching it, it's only a minute and a half long, it's basically just a marketing tool based around a play on the Gillette tagline and an attempt to cash in on both controversy from conservatives and support from liberals. Go watch that 1H Bummer Guy video on the subject if you're that bothered about it, but it's basically just a company weaponizing online viral marketing by targeting specific political groups for different reasons. Enter 32 and the beginnings of his moustache. Are you one of five and ten Caucasians that suffers from an embarrassing and debilitating genetic affliction? Can you not leave the house without hitting or raping a woman? Unable to resist the urge to belittle, shame and sexually harass your female colleagues at work? Did you spend your childhood beating the shit out of your friends at barbecues? Do you still spend your social gatherings revealing your spectacular abs and whipping out your member to compare? Then, I'm afraid, what you have feared is true. You suffer from a horrific disease. Maleness. Don't worry, my disgusting hairy friend. There is a cure. Anti-man. Proven to reduce your testosterone and eradicate your masculinity within 30 days or your money back. So, there we have it. Putting aside for a moment the fact that he's only defending Caucasians here, despite the fact that the ad had multiple people of colour in it, and certainly wasn't specific to any one race, this unfunny opening joke is an insightful look into what 42 thinks the SJWs think about masculinity, and of course completely skips over the actual definition because that might actually make him look like a bit of a knob. Further, he doesn't really bother to respond to the actual ad itself, as opposed to a straw man of it. Which is not a term I like bringing up, because a lot of the time you're just straw manning me is an excuse right-wingers bring up in order to shut down criticism of their actual beliefs because, well, if they don't admit to being a white nationalist, they can't possibly be one. Therefore, calling them one is a straw man and is typical of the left to call everyone they disagree with a white nationalist, even if they explicitly support white nationalist ideals. Obviously, this is completely ridiculous, but it's clearly just a dumb joke, so I won't bring up the whole soy thing being a myth. However, it is worth noting that here, 42's resolution to these prevalent negative behaviours in men is to stop being a man, as if toxicity was inherent to being a man or something, which, spoilers, is exactly what he believes, more on this in a moment. But just bear in mind that every time he talks about toxic masculinity, he's not actually talking about toxic masculinity, he's talking about what he reckons it is, which is wrong. This is the message that a growing number of gender activists and corporations that wish to adopt a virtuous facade, most recently Gillette, would have us believe. Does anyone think this? I genuinely don't know what gender activists think that toxic masculinity means that masculinity is toxic, but most I've met, unlike the right-wingers I know, actually understand what the term means. Also, corporations are relying on the right getting pissy over this as much as they are the left supporting it. They're playing both sides here. If they thought it would make them more money, they would absolutely be bigoted. It works for Chick-fil-A. But what's the reality here? Based on social norms that have been developed over thousands of years, underpinned by biology, and using empirical evidence, I seek to rationalise masculinity, and answer an important question. Is being masculine bad for society? First problem here, social norms have not been developed over thousands of years. In fact, they have changed drastically during that time. In a lot of ancient and historical societies, showing emotion was seen as good for a man. Women were seen as the sexual aggressors. Some tribes had warrior women. Some cultures even had a third officially recognised gender. Our current social norms are really not as old as he thinks they are. Old enough to have shaped our current culture, sure, but not that old. Women only started shaving because shaving companies wanted to ship more bullshit products Someone like Jason Momoa would have been called a sissy not too long ago for the long hair. It's just a really bad idea to start off with shitty generalisations like this. A good start would be finding out what is masculinity anyway. It is entirely distinct from an individual's biological sex. Sure, masculine traits stem from a person's sex. Masculinity is not biological. Please. Please tell me that this doesn't become a pseudoscientific diatribe about the true meaning of manhood. But if we're getting technical, then masculinity itself is a social construct that describes a set of traits innately present in most men. No, they don't, unless of course you think that this person is masculine and this person isn't feminine. Trans people exist as the non-binary and intersex people, and let's not go down the androgyny rabbit hole. The point here is that sex and gender are not the same thing, and masculinity is related to gender, not sex. The same traits, however, can often be found in women 
not always and often to lesser extremes. If it's a social construct, then by definition they cannot be innately present. I know a lot of people of various genders who display both traditionally masculine and traditionally feminine traits because people are not so easily put into boxes like that. It's more complex and interesting than 42 wants to admit. The traits of masculinity can also differ slightly between world cultures, but the core traits that define a masculine man are universally consistent. No, they're not, as we'll soon see, but if these traits can be experienced by women, then clearly masculinity is not explicitly male, and if different cultures can experience masculinity in different ways, then what even is the point in trying to have this distinction? If a masculine man in Korea would be considered unmasculine in Russia or whatever, if that's the case, then clearly it's an arbitrary distinction and by definition cannot be universally consistent. Again, no one's saying that masculinity is inherently bad, but that certain aspects of it, if focused on too hard or interpreted in the wrong way can become bad. Working out isn't toxic, but pumping yourself full of steroids and working out for 8 hours a day in order to achieve an ideal of masculinity, which frankly doesn't really exist outside of your head, absolutely is. Look at that. No way. So you're going to work out with that one? As you put it, you should, yeah. But he's trying to sweat out excess water risking dehydration and even heat stroke. Come on, mate, look, it's completely flat. What is wrong with that? It may be flat, but it's not good enough. It's too much water, you know? You know, I'm too not... much water where? What, there? See, it's not showing enough here. So I, I, I'm, I'm just not pleased with it. Now he's going to lift weight in 82 degree heat. You're about to do another workout, but in yeah, the sauna. It'll be my third session of today. And these are going in there with you? I would train with them and do push-ups in there as well, yeah. Mate. I just want the perfect body. Of course, you have to perfect as any get. But please don't take this the wrong way. No. This isn't fitness. No. This is something else. This is, this is punishing your body. Yeah, it's This is it, pushing your body. Put my body in places it shouldn't be. Body, but the body wasn't built for this. The body wasn't built for this to do that. It is not built for it. What you're doing is so... It's dangerous. It's so dangerous. It is. Surely you've got to understand that you can't keep doing this. Um, How old are you? Is yeah. it 26? 24. 20, mm. 24? Mm. I mean, what's your body going to be like at 30? I'd be lucky to get there. Quick personal anecdote, I used to work with a guy who was a bit like this, who was so insecure, he'd work out and pump himself full of steroids to the point where he was huge, but he took so many steroids he couldn't pop a boner. So, in order to counteract that, he ordered a ton of Viagra online. So he worked out in order to pull women, and then once he got women to the bedroom, he'd have to use medication to get a boner. <laughs> you see the difference there? It's exaggerating a neutral or even positive aspect of masculinity to an extreme degree in order to achieve a non-existent paradigm of peak masculinity. Masculinity. What are these traits? Stoicism, resilience, strength, courage, independence, and assertiveness. Here we are then, the five horsemen of masculinity. First off, Stoicism. Absolutely not the case. In fact, in ancient Greek society, the display of emotion was seen as a positive trait in many ways. Almost all Homeric heroes, for example, openly wept in his stories, and this was not condemned or shown as weakness. Resilience is a weird one. What does he mean here? Persistence? Resistance to pain? If it's the former, then I've no women stick to their guns on important issues where men simply couldn't famously in the people's filibuster to protect abortion rights, and of course the inspirational stories throughout the suffragette and feminist movements, including hunger strikes and one woman even throwing herself in front of a horse. And anyone who thinks that women can't handle pain is an idiot who's never spoken to women about either the pain of childbirth or period cramps. Strength, once again, is completely arbitrary. Presumably he means emotional strength, because physical strength isn't an indicator of someone's identity, and would mean that a female bodybuilder is more manly than an average man, which is clearly absurd. Even if we do mean strength of character though, I'm really not 100% certain on what he means by it, but it would be, I think, very similar to resilience, in that not only is it gender neutral, but it's completely nonsensical to call it a masculine trait any more than having arms is a feminine trait. Courage, again, not a uniquely male thing by any stretch, and kinda meaningless. Returning again to Ancient Greece, which I hope is the last time because I don't want to be a classics wanker, just because I like that one Jason and the Argonauts movie with the stop motion monsters, in traditional Athenian thought, women who took bold and decisive action could be viewed
viewed as disruptive to society and to nature as well. The actions of daring women were attributed to tolma or audacity rather than Andrea, courage. Socrates asserted in the 4th century BCE, however, that women equally shared the quality of Andrea or courage with men. Although Socrates' assessment would be controversial, ultimately it became almost commonplace that women had and needed courage in order to protect their chastity. The Dorian Greeks also held different views from the Athenians and praised women who took decisive action in times of warfare. By the Roman era, if not earlier, a conception of female masculinity that was tied to sexuality became prevalent in Greek literature. Misspelled that there, mate. Don't get me wrong, I make typos and stupid mistakes all the time, mostly when I crop quotes by accident, but I don't have editors and millions of subscribers, and I use free editing software. Could have just asked someone to give it a quick check over before uploading, you know? So, independence. What does it mean? Autonomy? Not a predominantly male attribute. Also, we live in a society, yes, post the memes, but we do live in a society which requires cooperation. Society cannot function unless we agree to play by the rules. Incidentally, this is why strikes and revolutions work. The masses refusing to play by the rules grinds institutions and societies to a halt. And no one is truly independent. In ancient times we worked together for the good of the tribe, and in modern times no one escapes the pressures of capitalism and societal expectations. You can be self-employed, stay at home all day and never interact with another person, but you still need money to survive. You still need to interact with your landlord to pay rent, the supermarket to source your food and so on. Unless you really are just living on your own in the forest as a wild man, you can never really be independent and humans basically never have been. Our society relies on interconnected and complex systems to function, and they pretty much always have. This is an old Jordan Peterson level idea, the thesis behind it being men are assertive and women are agreeable because biology, even though this is mostly due to socialisation and a society that conditions us to act in certain ways, not the assertiveness gene or whatever. Now before we all judge men for being too assertive, occasionally resorting to violence or to stoic for not displaying emotion. It's important to understand where these traits actually come from. Ooh, ooh, pick me, I know, I know. Assertiveness leading to aggression, violence, and controlling behavior comes from the toxic idea that men need to be in control of all situations, and therefore when they're not, this can cause severe insecurity, leading to lashing out, and our culture that shames men for showing emotion leads to emotionally damaged men who often suffer from extreme mental health issues as a result. The traits themselves are not social constructs. Men don't become masculine just because we tell them that crying is for girls and man up. No, men become toxically masculine because of these things. Masculinity in men may be enhanced or even enforced by certain cultures, by social pressures, but make no mistake, masculine traits originate from our biology, constructed over a period of 200,000 years. But 32 just declared masculinity a social construct, so how can he go back and claim it's biological now? How can something like Stoicism be biological? Did the ancient Greeks have different biology to us? Were they a different species of human? Long ago, nature's doctrine of survival of the fittest decided that the most efficient way to perpetuate a species through reproduction and ensure its longevity was by dividing each species into two sexes. This division is seen across the entire animal kingdom, what can also be observed in all animal species and humans are the different roles inherent within each sex. With the exception of the male pregnancy witnessed in the Cynephidae family of fish, the young of all species are incubated by the female sex. Here we're back to the sex equals gender thing. At least he acknowledges the outliers, but doesn't see that the fact that there are outliers at all kind of implies that it can't be a biologically consistent system at all. If gender is a binary, there cannot possibly be more than two genders. That's how binary systems work. The actual word he's looking for is bimodal, like lionesses who go out and do all the hunting, and hyenas of which the females are bigger and more physically dominant and do most of the fighting when they meet rival packs, or African elephants, herds of which are led by a matriarch and so on and so forth. It's not a short list and I don't want to spend all day doing zoological research. That's a lie. I would absolutely love to do that, but I do have a video to make. It therefore makes sense, logistically, that females evolved to have behavioural and physiological traits that are conducive to the healthy development and loving nurture of their young. Empathy, emotional awareness, patience, and tenderness. This right here is a real problem. 
See these traits? These are traits everyone can and absolutely should have, and above all, value. The fact that these traits are considered feminine, and that therefore a man displaying them might be considered inferior or unmanly, could not be a more damning indictment of our backwards view of gender than anything else I could mention. I display these traits, and am I less of a man? Am I a woman now? Fucking hell. Obviously, it was also vital that the females never put themselves or their young in a situation of danger. So, evolution naturally put that onus on the other sex, males. Males developed a greater aptitude for physical strength and the natural courage to hunt to provide food for their tribe and women. Is he serious with the stock footage of lions there? Does he know anything about lions? It's not courage, it's desperation. People will do anything to eat, you know? Multiple cultures have had warrior and or hunter women. Once the babies are born and onto solid food, why does it have to be the women who look after them? Are dads incapable of looking after toddlers? Were the people around looking at dads playing with kids and saying, oh, you're doing the babysitting today, are you? Like a hundred thousand years ago or something. Surely it would make sense for the older members of the tribe to look after the children since they'd be less effective hunters. Men evolved to have aggressiveness, resilience and assertiveness underpinned by undying competitiveness, so they could compete against rival males and protect their tribe from other, scarier tribes who had larger, pointier sticks. This is not true, please provide a source, otherwise I'm just going to assume that you made it up. Also, competitiveness is bullshit, he's literally showing pictures of Neanderthals cooperating there. Again, this is not any of the aforementioned male attributes. Also, women don't necessarily always value these things, so competing for women with violence isn't like he's saying it is, and defending yourself from rival tribes is more of a desperate struggle for survival as opposed to bravery. Is he trying to argue that women wouldn't help to fight in that situation? So rival tribes are attacking and all the women just sit there and allow it to happen, do they? They don't bother to defend themselves or their families. Sure, those traits were essential pre-civilization. But why can't we get rid of them today through the systematic emasculation of men? Are they not redundant in the 21st century? No one is emasculating men. They're merely saying maybe men could be better and or happier if we changed how we see masculinity and valued compassion over aggression, for example. No one is saying this. Don't such traits cause nothing but toxicity and evil throughout our societies? These are the edicts that many social justice warriors seek to mandate on modern men. That's not what toxic masculinity is! Oh my god. He's really beating the shit out of that scarecrow right now. Masculinity is a shifting social construct. Its very nature has mutated over the generations. Today, it is more socially acceptable than ever before in the history of humanity. But I thought it was biological and unchanging. Not remotely correct, as mentioned before, there's ancient Greece, but our society is hardly one of tolerance for the sensitive man. I'm a sensitive guy and I've been called a pussy and less of a man for showing emotion by toxically masculine men in the not too distant past. This is not some enlightened age of emotional openness. Men are still killing themselves at record rates because they feel unable to open up emotionally and seeking help is often stigmatised for men. For a man to show emotion and share his feelings with his friends. For a man to cry, for a man to choose another man as a sexual partner and marry him. First off, sexuality is not a choice, I thought we'd establish this, and also I hate to bring it up constantly but I'm sorry. Ancient Greece is known for two things, philosophy and homosexuality. Male erotic love was considered one of the highest forms of love by many and the Greeks were not shy about depicting it all over their urns. All of these are truly amazing and undeniably positive advances towards a better, more harmonic world, and none of these things degrade a man's masculinity. But they're definitively unmasculine going by the definition provided earlier. But these are not the traits that authoritarian leftist activists are trying to suppress. No, because these traits are not toxic. We're not trying to suppress men's tendency to enjoy sports either, because there would be no reason to. It's not hurting anyone, but this point is kind of moot because 32 literally just defined femininity as exactly this stuff, so by his own definition, masculine traits are not the positive ones. The positive ones are men expressing apparently feminine traits. What is under fire is the more assertive, domineering and 
tough side that is biologically present in every man to varying degrees. Ignoring the biologically present stuff because I don't want to repeat myself too much is not even assertiveness that we're calling for an end to, it's aggression, violence and other toxic behaviours that can come with it if assertiveness is taken too far or obsessed over by insecure men. Such traits and the actions which can be associated with them are too often referred to as toxic masculinity. The issue here is that so-called toxic behaviour is not endemic to masculine men, or even men. Yes, he gets it, it's not all men or masculinity that's a fault, but these traits that when taken too far can cause toxic behaviour. Woo! We can end the video, he gets it, right? Evil and malice are present across all demographic cross-sections of society. Evil and malice are pretty ideologically based though. I would call Elon Musk evil and 32 probably thinks I am. There's no denying that men commit crime and nobody would claim that either sex is perfect. But before shunning masculinity, it's imperative that we understand how dangerous this can be. No, men commit an overwhelming majority of crime, that's the point here. It's not about women being perfect, it's about men being overwhelmingly more violent. For one simple reason. Masculinity does far more good than bad for everyone, both men and women. And not just a little bit more good. For every bad deed that a man commits in the world, I would propose that well over a thousand good deeds are carried out by other masculine men every day. No, men do far more good than bad. Masculinity is an arbitrary set of characteristics we came up with in order to categorise a set of socially constructed behaviours. It's neither good nor bad. Only a fool would argue that men never do bad. In 2014, 73% of those arrested in the US were male. but. To live in a society where the majority of good men are publicly shamed for the crimes of the minority of bad men is damaging to the mental health and sense of purpose of men the world over. Especially when this underlying and natural biological trait of the male species are being labelled as the cause of all these evils. If this was actually happening, I would agree, but it's not, and also this same argument could be used for, for example, leftists and SJWs. Why is 32 demonising all leftists just because some of them are mean about men? Leftists do far more good than bad, and so on and so forth, and I'm not going to do his whole bit back at him, you get the point. You know what else is damaging to the mental health and sense of purpose of men the world over? A society that pressures them not to show emotions and tells them to go be a breadwinner, whilst also squeezing the working class to breaking point in order to concentrate the wealth at the top, thus robbing them of any real potential of achieving the goal they themselves insisted they should have. It also pulls all the attention away from the many beautiful things that most masculine men achieve every single day, which vastly outnumber the horrendous things a much smaller portion of masculine men do. Do not forget that masculinity was born from a natural desire for men to provide for and protect their family. But the problem is that these things are not done because these men are toxically masculine because toxic masculinity, unlike regular masculinity, is inherently negative. Toxic people can still do good and of course toxically masculine men are not inherently evil or something, but that's not the point. The point is that often a reliance on and desperation to adhere to rigid hypermasculine ideals can lead to toxic behaviours. When a man takes his daughter to school, gives her a kiss and wishes her a good day, that is masculinity doing good. How is it masculinity doing that? Sounds more like 42's definition of femininity to be honest. When a man works 10 hours a day to feed, clothe and shelter his family, that is masculinity doing good. Oh my god, no it's not. That's capitalism doing evil and exploiting people. These are just men doing things, not masculinity. Not everything a man does is masculine. Did I do a really masculine shit this morning? Am I going to make a masculine sandwich after I upload this video? When a firefighter rescues a child from a burning building, that is masculinity doing good. When a policeman arrests a perpetrator of domestic abuse, rape, or murder, that is masculinity doing good. 
It's a man stopping a potentially toxically masculine man continuing to commit crimes. Domestic abuse is usually a result of toxic masculinity, though not exclusively, of course. When a young man shields his sweetheart with his jacket when it rains, that is masculinity doing good. That's an old man, but also, no, it's not. It's an act of compassion which is apparently feminine and also very much something that a woman could do for a man just as easily. When a surgeon saves a person's life through open heart surgery, that is masculinity doing good. Surgeons can also be women, though these are all fucking nonsensical. When Alexander Fleming invented penicillin, saving millions of lives, that was masculinity doing good. And when millions of brave men gave their lives to prevent fascism and tyranny from engulfing our world in 1914 and 1939, that was masculinity doing good. But both sides were mostly made up of male soldiers, and the concentration camps were mostly staffed by male SS officers. So was World War II good masculinity versus bad masculinity? I imagine it was probably a little bit more complicated than that. Also, the USSR did a lot of the fighting in World War II. Was that Stalin's masculinity doing good, or was it the masculinity of the Red Army doing good? The truth is, trying to control a tiny minority of bad men by quashing masculinity in all men is an exercise in futility and idiocy. Good thing that's not happening then, I guess. Bad men will not stop being bad because they become less masculine. They will only become more frustrated, and frustrated people are more likely to commit injustices than content people. No, but if we, as a society, raise men to be less toxic, value different things, and actively try to remove some of those toxic, harmful elements of the way we currently view gender and gender expectations, we might be able to reduce the amount of toxic, damaging behaviour. He's so close to getting the point, but not quite there. The result will be fewer good masculine men to stop the bad men and bad women from being bad. Ah yes, the old good guy with a gun argument, always a classic. I mean, it's not like treating people with more compassion and focusing our societal goals on helping people as opposed to enforcing strict norms and expectations and ruthlessly exploiting one another for profit would have any effect on the way people currently behave, right? I mean, take prisoners, for example. Good masculine prison wardens treating bad masculine prisoners brutally definitely stops them committing crimes, and treating them with compassion is unmasculine and makes them frustrated and encourages them to become more violent. Oh, wait, no, the opposite of that is true. Masculinity and femininity are the two pillars that underpin a cohesive, progressive, and productive society that is beneficial to all. Okay, so all these societies are not cohesive, productive, and progressive? Just as an example, in Hinduism, the god Shiva is still worshipped as an... Oh, there's always one. <laughs> there's always one word. In each video. Okay, Ardnarishwara, or half male, half female form. Shiva's symbol, which is today known as the Shiva Linga, actually comprises a combination of a yoni, vagina, and a lingam, phallus. The third genders have been ascribed spiritual powers by most indigenous societies, and there have been amazing, wonderful things to have come out of Hindu culture, but it's inconvenient, so let's just ignore it. Why is splitting these traits up into two distinctive groups, rather than allowing everyone to display whatever combination of traits they want, preferable? How is enforcing strict norms on a society progressive? Why is being productive important, but happiness and people being comfortable isn't? He's portraying these things as positive, but this guy on the left is in a war zone carrying a dead guy, which yeah sure is masculine, but I imagine not positive, and what the fuck is going on with that baby? Shorten or remove either one of those pillars and society as we know. The society that we've built over thousands of years and the society that we've protected against tyranny and evil will come crashing down beneath our very feet. Couple things. First, how and in what way? Why do gender norms, of all things, dictate how our society functions? I know he's doing the classic right-wing thing of pretending that the West is one single cohesive culture when it demonstrably isn't, but even so, this is utter bullshit. Yet. How does modern society thank these everyday, incredible men? They are widely vilified. On social media, in the press, in schools, and in popular culture, and now, even, in advertisements, the historic bastion of greedy capitalism. What are his examples of this? I guarantee you that of all groups, men are among the least maligned in all of media. This is an absurd claim. Men aren't oppressed for fuck's sake. This is eerily close to a high production no bullshit video. Yes, Gillette 
criticise toxic behaviour, not men. Sorry, but that's pretty obvious. The tagline explicitly stated that as men we could be better, not that men are bad. It was a call to action, not a condemnation. A disingenuous one, and a blatantly deliberately inflammatory attempt to rile up people like 42 for viral marketing, but a call to action all the same. Don't worry, this isn't a drift away from greedy capitalism, it's an example of it. This has resulted in men committing suicide at three times the rate of women. No it hasn't, this, this is fucking disgusting. It's been well documented that the high suicide rate is due to men's inability to reach out and express their emotions, among other things. But this idea that it's because men are sometimes criticised for toxic behaviour in fucking razor adverts is absurd and offensive to the victims of this phenomena and their families. And these men who help build and improve our society every day face other challenges at an alarming ratio. Men are twice as likely to be the victim of a violent assault or robbery, 3.5 times more likely to be murdered. Men are also twice as likely to perpetrate said assault, robbery or murder. Cis women are between 4 and 10 times more likely to suffer sexual assault than men, and trans women suffer violent attacks at a frighteningly high level. We have a lot of problems in our society regarding violence, but saying, oh woe is me, think of the men, whilst ignoring the non-male victims of crime, doesn't help anyone. 96% of workplace fatalities happen to men. Okay, first of all, it's fatalities. Also, this is mostly due to our sexist attitudes towards men, as the rugged, strong ones who should do all the hard jobs, and women as the weaker ones who should stick to an office or remain at home. I briefly worked in a male-dominated manual labouring job, and it was incredibly unwelcoming to women almost by design. If I was a woman, I don't know how long I would have stayed, but I guarantee you, not for long. Men are 5.6 times as likely as women to be incarcerated. This is because men are proportionally more violent, in part as a result of toxic masculinity, and also, as we established earlier, commit more crimes. 86% of the homeless population is male. But men feeling unable to seek help before it's too late and wanting to remain stoic is the issue here. Is that masculinity doing good? Boys have been lagging behind girls in educational achievement since 1991, and the gap is widening every year. So why are women not dominating in academic jobs? Almost as if there's some kind of systemic issue causing these problems that needs to be addressed before we can really assess this with any degree of accuracy. Some kind of system that prioritises men over people of other genders, in subtle but very real ways. Can't put my finger on the exact term. Ah oh, well, I'm sure it'll come to me. Also, why aren't men just being resilient and dealing with all those issues independently? Almost as if we need cooperation in order to resolve these issues. This last point indicates a far more concerning fact that the increasing shaming of masculinity in our schools is causing a crisis in the development of young men. Where did he get that? It could easily just be that as women become more prominent in our society, more girls see themselves being represented and become more invested in schooling, or that women are just biologically more intelligent. I mean, it makes as much sense as men being biologically stoic, so why not? Competitive games that are deemed too aggressive, such as British Bulldog or Tag, and Dodgeball have been long since banned in many school playgrounds in the West. This really isn't true. In some isolated cases, yes, sure, but not across the board. Also, Tag has been declared aggressive, is it? Show me a case where that happened so I can laugh at it. Conkers, I definitely get, because that's fucking brutal. What has all this got to do with masculinity, though? A few schools in Britain are even considering banning the sport of rugby, a fundamental part of masculine development in young boys since 1823. I really don't think that anyone will be adversely affected if they don't get to play rugby. Don't get me wrong, I like rugby just fine, it's better than most sports, and unlike football, England are actually not bad at it, but it is a sport and it's not like replacing it with, say, tennis will cause any kind of developmental issues, is it? Also you have to wear a gum shield, and doing the mould thing is fucking child abuse, I swear to Christ. Whilst these games and sports can, on rare occasions, cause injuries, and perhaps we should find ways to make them safer for children. They do play a vital role in developing character and a strong competitive attitude in young boys that will enable them to later in life compete in the workplace and ultimately protect their family. So, the reason we need to encourage an unhealthy attitude of hyper-competitiveness in boys is so that they can grow up to exploit others in the capitalist hellscape. Not exactly selling it to me, but was this bit about protecting their family? What, is a scrum half going to attack them or something? I suppose maybe a hooker, depending on which side of town you're in. That was my one sports joke. I hope you enjoyed it, because there will be no more. 
In fact, competitiveness, which is predominantly a masculine trait, has been mostly eradicated from our schools in the West. During sports day and other events, everyone is given a participation award. There is no winner or loser. Oh yes, very original. A participation trophy joke. I guess I should have expected it, what with the soy stuff at the beginning. Are we getting less competitive because of this? Has the West embraced communism because of participation trophies? Or is it just a fun thing to do for kids on sports day? Also, participation trophies have been shown to actually increase a child's engagement with an activity. Positive reinforcement and all that. But I guess actual fact-based results don't really matter, right? What even is truth, anyway? Your child doesn't want to be perceived as different. He wants to fit in and be accepted by his peers. In fact, your child will try harder and enjoy a sport more if, rather than being singled out for his talent, he is rewarded for his participation. I failed miserably at sports, I finished last on sports day, and I wasn't given a trophy for taking part. I got nothing. And you know what it taught me? To respect those who are superior to you, that some people are just better than others and that you should lick the boots of your capitalist masters just as you must concede that you are simply not as good as kids who could run faster than you. Okay, seriously though, sports day is just supposed to be fun for kids. Please stop making it into a whole thing. The next time, I need to try harder. That I would never amount to anything unless I put the effort in and practice my socks off. And if you can't? Seriously, no matter how hard I try, I'll never be able to outrun Usain Bolt, just as no matter how hard I tried, I could never beat the sporty kids in my school. You know what that taught me? It doesn't fucking matter how fast you can run, and sports day is just a bit of a laugh. And you know what? My inability to do well in the long jump has never come back to adversely affect me in later life. Who takes sports day this seriously? Jeez. Not just in sports, but in every aspect of life. That was one of the most important lessons I have ever learned. Hard work pays off, kids. Capitalism is a meritocracy and I'm a clownish buffoon. I mean, it's not like success in the real world has anything to do with luck or circumstance, right? Jeff Bezos just works six million times harder than I do, and that's why I don't have over a hundred billion dollars. I'm just six million times lazier than Jeff. In the same way that over-sanitization during youth leads to a weak immune system, mollycoddling children is not how strong societies are built. Doing so is, in reality, a threat to building a strong society for the next generation. True, but treating children with kindness could be a fantastic way to start building a better society, one built on cooperation rather than competitiveness. We could still teach children the harsh realities of life without turning them into sociopaths or landlords. This is the same thing. But nowhere is misandry more rife than in Swedish schools. Several preschools and primary schools in Sweden have gone to extensive efforts to remove the words boy and girl from the children's vocabularies. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. I knew it was going to come down to trans people in the end. Preferring the gender-neutral pronoun hen. A legal addendum in 1998 mandated all schools in Sweden to actively work against gender stereotypes Sweden is an amazingly progressive place, but I'm afraid that this horseshit is just not true. Boy and girl are not removed at all, however, there is a push to use hen as a gender-neutral alternative. I think this is actually really cool, and of course we'll see how it plays out in around 20 years or so once those kids enter society as adults. But for now, honestly, I don't see the harm. We already have they as a gender-neutral pronoun, and gender is already pretty arbitrary as it is anyway. This all sounds very utopian, in theory. But in practice, it is nothing short of brainwashing, and it leads to a difficult and confusing progression into teenhood and adulthood for these poor children. I like how he just says, this sounds good and I have no evidence that it's not, but it's actually bad because reasons. Look, he may be right, this may be a total disaster, but for now we have no answers because these kids are still too young for it to have any impact on society. I'm not going to pass judgement until we get those results, but that's not going to stop 42 just reckoning that it'll be bad based on his own view of the world. They are being taught to ignore basic science, go against the natural biological pull of their very own bodies. This will only achieve to create a generation of frustrated, passive men. Boys playing with trucks is not science, and there is no natural pull to masculine traits since they're all societally constructed, as Dolty 2 acknowledged earlier, and can therefore change, or even not exist anymore in future. Without being free to indulge in their masculinity in the playground and at home, 
then these boys will grow into men who are unable to compete in the workplace and in personal matters, unable to defend themselves and their families. So they'll be starting up worker co-ops and citizens' militias. Sounds good to me. Very Lenin. If evidence of this brainwashing were needed, then I endeavour you to look no further than Seafarer's Preschool in Sweden, where boys and girls as young as one are actually segregated so their natural gender roles can be systematically indoctrinated out of them. Boys are made to play with toy kitchens and give each other massages. Girls are forced to practice shouting no. A so-called gender specialist is employed by the preschool to pick up on and coerce boys who refuse to partake in feminine activities such as dance. Boys are encouraged to wear dresses, and the teachers celebrated when one particular girl who used to be very girly, according to her mother, was reared by the preschool to become more boisterous, and her parents noted that she had become more cheeky and defiant at home. I looked this up and it's actually a social experiment, not anything that's actually being implemented on a wide scale. It's an experiment to see how ingrained gender norms are in children, and how young the societal factors start to affect us. Shockingly, it was observed that when the children were no longer forced to play with toys typically favoured by the opposite gender, that the boys reverted to playing with cars and the girls' dolls. The boys shouted and hit more. Boys will be boys. Almost as if living in a society can shape your behaviours, and in order for the experiment to work, the scientists had to isolate the kids as much as possible from the outside world. The preschool says, this is not okay. Well golly, it's almost as if their biology compels them to adhere to their natural gender roles, and that forcibly preventing them from embracing this is actually child abuse. Just a thought. An inability to protect his family is not the only issue that an emasculated man will face in adulthood. It's a natural gender role for boys to play with cards and girls to play with dolls. In prehistoric times, Neolithic male children were playing with toy cars tens of thousands of years before either the car or the wheel was invented. It's just biology. What is all this emphasis on protecting the family? Is Dorothy 2 randomly being accosted by groups of attackers or wild dogs or something? Does he live in Skyrim and have to deal with random bandit encounters? I'll be honest with you, I've been in very few fights in my life and none as an adult, mostly because I've never been randomly attacked on the street before, so I've not had to be. In 32's normal life, does he just go into a Weatherspoons and find himself in a massive bar fight every weekend? What is just as crucial is a man's ability to lead and inspire his family, particularly his children. Why does this role have to be carried out by a man? What about gay couples and families? Who leads in a gay couple? Do lesbian couples not get to be inspired by one another? When a masculine presence is stripped away from an otherwise nuclear family unit, the consequences can often be disastrous. Don't get me wrong, there is no rule that children can't thrive in a non-nuclear family. Different family setups can absolutely nurture incredible children. But looking solely at fatherlessness, the statistics show a clear trend. Children who grow up without a father figure are twice as likely to drop out of school, twice as likely to become obese, and four times as likely to succumb to poverty. They are also more likely to commit crime, go to prison, abuse alcohol or drugs, and fatherless girls are seven times as likely to fall pregnant as a teen. This is the Sargon thing again. He's putting a thumb on the scale here. It's not a lack of masculine presence, it's only having one parental figure. These studies show that having one parent can sometimes lead to problems, but this is by no means definitive and also doesn't control for other factors like having a second parental authority figure in the kids' lives who isn't necessarily a father or father figure. It's deliberately deceptive. After all this rhetoric, there's an important distinction that must be made. I myself, and I sincerely hope that other men out there, have no desire to strip men of their right to choose how they want to develop through life. If men want to go against their natural masculinity, or even seek to abolish it, then we should all work to protect their rights to do so. Masculinity is not naturally occurring, but if it was, why would anyone subvert or want to abolish it? Surely if it's natural and biological, no one would bother, almost as if it's not biological at all. And me? I say more power to you. But it's so very important that men 
have the right to choose. Just like freedom of speech, it's essential that as a society we work to protect a man or a woman's right to live how they want to live, be who they want to be, walk how they want to, talk how they want to, and wear whatever they damn well desire. Sure, but when they're kids, they don't have that choice, and we're all shaped by our society and the gender norms contained therein. Also, there are clearly limits to this. 42 is obviously against domestic abuse, although we disagree on the main causes of it, and presumably doesn't think that men should be allowed to do that as much as they damn well desire. He seems to be coming out in support of non-binary and gender non-conforming people here after 18 minutes of whining about how gender is biological and is intrinsically tied to sex. Weird choice, and it does definitely come across as disingenuous. But when it comes to a man's right to fully embrace and assert his masculinity in a positive way, it's labelled as sexist male privilege by the media and tribal activists on the internet and on campus. No, it's not. Only when it's toxic. I'm starting to think that 42 doesn't understand the core concept here. Is anyone else getting that? In doing so, a man's right to choose to embrace his masculinity is being eroded more and more so every year. That's why it's vital that when companies such as Gillette seek to tar all men with the same discriminatory brush and suppress our right to embrace our biology that we fight to retain our rights to be whoever the hell we want to be. Masculinity should be empowered, not shamed and belittled. Men everywhere must continue to show the world that overall, masculinity is a force for good, not evil. Never be ashamed of your masculinity, my hairy friends, because it built the roads beneath your feet. Well, that was an interesting boxing match Thorsey 2 just had with a scarecrow, wasn't it? Pity he didn't bother to address any of the actual points, but oh well, I guess you win some, you lose some. As I believe I may have mentioned a couple of times today, toxic masculinity doesn't mean that masculinity is inherently toxic because sometimes words have meanings and right-wingers can't fucking read. Men are not the most depressed group in society. Men have serious problems, yes, but they're not exactly on the bottom rung, and massive corporations like Gillette, run by and for men, certainly don't have some kind of agenda to diminish masculinity or some shit. Please, for the love of God, stop whining about how bad men have it and actually take a look at some of the groups with real problems that don't have to be made up in order to make you care, I beg of you. Every day No, it's probably the tea